Ann Arbor Ways Goose and Printing Festival, Voices in Print Speaker Series. I want to introduce um, Amos Kennedy. He is our first speaker. He is the creator of the art on the walls here. And he will have a little chit chat on the stage with Sherlania Turner. She works here at the library. And so we are delighted to kick things off. So welcome. Thank you both. Well, thank you. <clears throat> so what are we talking about today? And that was it. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. And where's Sarah Brown now? <laughs> oh, I don't know. What do you want to talk about? I think we should talk about the, uh, it just dawned on me that this is the Ways Goose for the state of Michigan. You know, it's the oldest and the biggest Ways Goose in the state of Michigan. And That's fascinating. And it is sponsored by, the, by a public library which is the public library is one of the last of the commons in this country. It's the only place where a citizen can go. You know, you can just walk into a public library. You don't need to pay an admission like you have to do at most museums or, you know, anything else. So this is, you know, it's like really nice that this thing that's associated with the book is being sponsored in an institution that houses the book. And I, can, I hope that it will continue to grow and get bigger and, uh, you know, bring together the communities of letterpress printing, of all printing. It's not just letterpress printing. Most ways gooses are um, restricted, are defined by letterpress printing because a ways goose is this. How many of you know what a ways goose is supposed to be? Okay, that lets me know how many printers are here. <laughs> so I can tell the rest of you whatever I want, and you can just like, oh, you know. <laughs> and then afterwards, they can go back and say, you know, he lied, you know. <laughs> but um, the Ways Goose was, according to the lie that I heard, a Ways Goose was a goose that was set loose in the fields after the harvest was done, and they would eat the remaining grain on the ground, and they would get fat. And then after they were fattened, there was supposed to be this uh, celebration to a, pr to a saint associated with printing. And so that's, that's the uh, kind of back, background to a ways goose. But over the years, it's become this event where printers get together and tell lies and sell each other equipment and stuff that they bought last year from somebody else. <laughs> so the first Waze Goose I went to, I thought it was really interesting because I swear what happened was it was a bunch of older printers, like my age, and they were buying from each other because it's like their wives had told them to clean out the basement. And so someone else would buy it and then they would keep it to their wife told them. And then they would, and so it made the rounds around this little group of about 10 printers. That's mental note. Um, printers are tricky. Yeah. <laughs> printers also collect a lot of stuff that other people don't, you know. Well, so. what do you have in your collection that you think would be surprising to folks who may, may have uh, done a little internet stalking on you? Uh, I don't have anything really that would be surprising to uh, anyone. I have a very modest collection compared to some people in this room. I only have 2,000 square feet that I have to pack everything into. So uh, I have, you know, I just have the basics. I have 13 printing presses and, <laughs> and a little <laughs> bit of wood type. <laughs> I'm hoping to, you know, to expand at some point, you know. <laughs> That's interesting. So when I was looking around to find out more information about you, so I didn't come in here empty-headed um, entirely, um, I felt like I was reading about a mythological person. <laughs> <laughs> I think called a lot of things. <laughs> because it's not a myth. <laughs> well, because they were like, his origins began here. Oh, no, they began here. And one day, magically, his calling poured into him. Like, what, what do you, do, do you pay any attention um, to any of these things? Oh, yes, so... as, as carefully as they say that these days, it's carefully curated. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and mythology uh, wasn't a part of that curation. No, I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't, uh, I, you know, 
uh, I just tell my story. I don't know how people could make it up into a myth because it's what really happened. I just happened to be in Williamsburg. Well, there's a backstory to it. I had always done calligraphy, mm -hmm. and I've always liked books and texts. And but it was with letterpress printing that everything kind of came together, mm -hmm. and I really felt that I could uh, actually do something because I think that every human being has within them this desire to make. And there is a way of making something that is perfectly suited for them. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, they don't get the opportunity to explore it. One, we have limitations because in school, they normally teach painting and drawing. you know, So they don't get into all the other forms of making. And then two, it is that um, you know, society puts these labels on it. So people either stray away from it because it's like, oh no, it's not for what I do. You know, I don't draw really good, so I can't be a drawer. And if I don't draw, then what can I do? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, no, drawing is not my thing, but something out there is. So let me continue to explore that. And then we just don't have the avenues of exploration. I mean, there's no place that really teaches you know, like embroidery. Why shouldn't kids learn how to embroider in school? You know, at least have the experience. Why shouldn't kids have experience making things out of wood, making things out of clay? You know, all these things. Because at some point you're going to say, this is the one that I like. This is the one that resonates with me. And so this is what I'm going to pursue. Mm -hmm. And so with me, I did a lot of, I played around with calligraphy for a number of years. But when I saw letterpress printing, it just resonated. Mm -hmm. And so I gravitated to it. And that's why I'm sitting here <laughs> talking to you. Sure. So um, in your, in, so before you found that, did you, feel, uh, did you feel like you were looking for your thing? Or did you feel like you were just kind of, what, what did you, what? Well, I was, uh, fortunately for me, I was a member of, uh, this civilization where life was very simple. It was not complicated. You were born, you went, to, you went to elementary school, you went to high school, you went to college, you got a job, you got married, you worked until you were 65, you retired and you played golf until you died. So, <laughs> so I had my life already st structured and uh, this kind of just threw everything out of whack. You know, it was, you didn't, I, again, we had, you know, for my generation, we just had this idea that there was cradle-to-grave employment, and we were supposed to fill that. Mm -hmm. You know, we were supposed to, you get that job, and it's all over with, you know, mm -hmm. because you put in your first 10 years, you're vested, and, you know, like, the company's going to take care of you forever. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> yeah. And it used to be that way. Mm hmm but uh, it's not for everybody, and it wasn't for me. I really did try, mm -hmm. but it just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. you know? What did that feel like? Uh, well, it felt like the seventh circle of Dante's hell. Ooh. <laughs> you know, I was up what, to my what, what waist, I was up to before? my waist in ice. <laughs> yeah. oh. That is upsetting. Um, what were you doing before you were? I was if bored. you want to talk about I it, you might bored. not. That's what I was like, doing. When I watched, a, I watched the documentary that was about you, and like it just kind of watching you move around and things like that. And you, you have a lot of energy. I saw you when you were walking into the library. I was driving here. I was like, he, this will not begin the way that documentary began, and he will not be talking about me being tardy. Um, <laughs> I hadn't looked at you. I was like, that guy's got some pep in his step. <laughs> For old man. Well, I, I hadn't taken a good look. And then I looked and I was like, he's wearing the, like, we're matching today. And then I was like, oh, I know exactly who that is. And so, like, when I was looking at the uh, documentary and, like, watching the energy, um, you know, with you in the studio and kind of doing the things, because right. you're pretty mobile. Like, you're, you're not, yeah. like, you're not somebody who's, like, sitting still. And I just, I was like, I wonder if he felt like this beforehand. Did you feel like a jack-in-the-box that was just, like, wound up that needed to pop out and do what you needed to do, or did it feel... 
No, I, uh, I don't know, because I was just in this environment that, you know, I was like, here's what you did, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, I was, I guess I would say I was comfortable. You know, I could have probably stayed there until like, like now when I retired. But it was not me. It was like horrible. Mm -hmm. And have you know, like it was one of these places. I know everyone has had that, where you only have fifteen minutes to go, but it takes two hours for that fifteen mm -hmm. minutes to happen. Yeah, that was like every day. You know, it's like where, why is it so? And then you had to be there, even if you didn't and didn't have anything to do. You know, like you know, like we paid for your time. You sit there. Mm -hmm. until it's time for you to go. You know, like, gee, that's, you know, very, and, but, you know, that's what we did. And so once I left, you know, I was like, hey, I don't have to be anywhere. I don't have to do anything. I just, you know, and believe it or not, things got a lot better for me. I believe it. Uh, I mean, you, know? you totally seem that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it, like in the way that the, based on the documentary anyway, yeah. you know what I mean? Like based on the snippets and like the 90 minutes of time that I spent uh, watching this curated view, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, talk to me about your your ideas around uh, people being able to have art. I think that that's interesting. Uh, well, yeah. Well, it's the one, I have a, uh, I'm like one of these people that don't believe in artists and art as defined by the greater society. Art is something that everybody does. Everyone is an artist. Everyone creates and makes things. So it's not an exclusive thing. And so I also believe that everybody wants beauty in their house. And as a person who makes stuff kind of by hand, you know, they've made with machines and stuff, but you know, people consider it handmade. <clears throat> My work should be available to anybody, not, you know, just to people who can afford six figure uh, four figures, you know, artwork. But it should be available to anybody and everybody. I mean, Walmart sells paintings that people buy because people want something in their house. So why shouldn't I sell something that people can buy and put in their house? Why shouldn't I compete with Walmart at Walmart prices? You know, like, all art doesn't have to be, you know, unaffordable. As a matter of fact, most of it should be affordable because you, what you want is you want your stuff in the world. You know, <clears throat> I tell people, I sell these posters, and am, am I selling my poster, or am I selling advertising for myself? Because if you buy one of my posters for $20, you know, people will see it in your house or at your desk and say, where did you get it? And they want to buy one. You know, so I, it creates this market, I guess would be the term, or this demand for it by having it at a price that people can afford. If I sold one piece for, you know, if I sold a book for $3,000 and it's in special collection, how many people will see that in the course of the year? A lot fewer than would see one of these for $10 that you put up at your cubicle because everybody who passes by your cubicle, everybody who sits in your cubicle is going to see it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more important to me. You know, how many people actually are impacted or affected by my work. Mm -hmm. So I want to get it out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so you've done workshops as well too, right? Yes, that's uh, primarily how I make my living. I'm really not a printer. <clears throat> my brother says I'm, I'm beyond printing. I am now an expert because I talk about it more than I do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, we have issues. <laughs> so, um, how do workshops feel for you? Like, what's how does it feel different to you? Um, you know, doing the printing versus doing the workshop. Uh, well, there's no difference. Uh, you know, uh, because when I do a workshop, basically. You know, it's the people just, uh, I am facilitating them making something that they want to make. Mm -hmm. Because, again, a lot of times people are hesitant to make stuff because we have this idea of perfection and it has to be just mm -hmm. right. And as I was telling the group last night, the first, what I always tell people is keep your expectations low. In this workshop, all you want to do is put some ink on paper and, you know, that's good. 
you know. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to spell a word, you know, don't worry about it if it's misspelled because people probably know what the word is. Mm -hmm. And in my career, what I've realized is that people have a tendency to see mistakes before they see anything else. The odd thing always catches a person's eye. And so that misspelled word was actually on purpose to make sure you were reading it, you know? <laughs> and then you tell me it's misspelled, and I said, well, you know what it's all about. So we, that's all that we, I want the message out there for. So when I do workshops, I just encourage people just to, just to print. Do you have something you want to say mm -hmm. that's not too long? Mm -hmm. And OK, let's say it. Mm -hmm. And we'll put it up, we'll print it, and we'll see what it Well, you don't like it, that's OK. Mm -hmm. You know, because the reason you don't like it is because you've done it. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't done it, you would not either like it or not like it. Mm -hmm. And it's the doing, it's the growing that you've experienced. So try it again. Yeah. Are you ever surprised by what happens in workshops? Or? I'm constantly surprised by what's happening in workshops. Because what it is is that someone who has... Abs uh, there's a saying... Limitations galvanize the imagination. And when you do something a lot, experience becomes a limitation. Mm -hmm. So it's like, this is the way I do it, so I do it this way. But people who've never done it, and people always ask me, can I do that? And I'm like, I don't know, try it. You know, I haven't done it, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. Then so that person who's never printed before has this vast, you know, expanse of, you know, like, can I? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can. I have no limitations. And so that becomes, uh, that becomes very interesting because they bring up things that I would probably never think of doing. Mm -hmm. And so I learn from my students just as much as they learn from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what do you like most about your craft? Uh, what I like most about printing, it's just so much fun, you know? Putting ink on paper is like the, you know, for me, it's the ultimate. And you can just, and then you can do whatever you want. I tell people what I do with these posters and what people do who print, you uh, make something that actually violates people's visual space when you put it up in public. And I like to put my stuff up in public. So that I really like because the violation of a person's visual space will allow the message that you want to get out there. And that is one of the things about printing, especially posters and placards and cards that you put out in public, is that it forces themselves upon people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Interesting. So one of the things that I read, or one of the words that kept coming up that I just was like, hmm, I wonder how he feels about this word, is provocative. Um, because like when I like uh, I tried to look at as many of your prints as I could right like right. once I once I saw that word I'm like I wonder what that means I never know what that means when someone's using it because people use it differently in different contexts and then I was looking at things and I was like I don't know which ones people are calling provocative I have some guesses uh, but some of that stuff I was like I don't think that's provocative people say that all the time or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so I just wondered what your relationship to uh, that word is. Well, my, I don't, you know, people, you know, Al Green said it best. They lied on Jesus, so surely they lie on you and me, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, people think I'm provocative. I'm like, okay, I'm that to you, you know, but I'm just having fun with myself. There are things that I intentionally print to create discomfort. And, but do you uh, feel like that's a different, like, because I feel like that's a different thing than being provocative. I feel like... If I, I, maybe it's just because I'm focusing too hard on the root word, like provoke, and I don't think that I don't. I, I think that if you're asking somebody to think, that's almost a gift as opposed to like a violent. In this civilization, it's it's not a gift. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you live, but asking someone to think in this world, it will get you shot. You know. <laughs> they do the thinking, I think that you've given them a gift. Uh, yeah, but most people don't want, people like comfort, you know, and that's what people want. They want, you know, it's like, I've worked hard today. I just want to go home and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why a lot of people go home and watch TV. 
mm -hmm. because it doesn't really require, you know, it is one of those, it's very passive in mm -hmm. some respects. You know, you know, like you, you look and you say, well, how is it that Thomas Jefferson could write more than, you know, 2,000 letters in his lifetime and I haven't written one? You know, because he didn't have a TV set to go home to. Mm -hmm. You know, you when you find you know you find somebody doing something, you say, well, wh why do you how is it you do that? And say, I go home and I do it. I mm -hmm. don't go home, and you know, and get on Facebook. I don't go home and watch TV. I go home and I quilt. I go home and I knit. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's because that's my enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And so we've gotten to this point where you know, you know, work work works you. You know, it just exhausts you, and you're like. I'm through with it. And so uh, I don't mind people saying I, I provoke mm -hmm. because everybody provokes in some way. They don't want to admit to it. Hmm. But, you know, you provoke people. You, you know, I don't think you can avoid that when you interact with people mm -hmm. because you do cause them to think. You cause them to question what they're doing. They may dismiss you. Mm -hmm. But at least they had, had acknowledged you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of art do you have hanging around in your, what kind of beautiful things, I'll say, do you yeah. have hanging in your spaces? A lot of pictures of me. <laughs> 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 I just mirror so I can see myself. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a lot of, uh, I'm, I really like prints, so I've always liked prints, so I have a lot of prints, and now I have a lot of work by other letterpress printers that uh, they gift or we exchange, so I have a lot of that going on. And I just have like, you know, I have a, a map from like 1950, one of the old school maps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I have another, it's from the science, uh, what is it, you know, from the, from the science room, the indigestion track. You know, so I was like, hey, it's, I mean, these things were beautifully printed. So, like, it's nice to have them. And, you know, I have a lot of, I have a lot of things that I collect off the side of the road, too. You know, are in the woods because they're these. Like what? Huh? <laughs> I, need, oh. I need more details on this, on these. <laughs> uh, no, you know, I, you know, like, I, I collect, I like rust. Okay. So I collect rusty things. You know, I collect rusty pieces of metal that are twisted and shaped because it's just kind of cool to me. And I also like, you know, driftwood and rocks and things like that, you know. I, you know, I, I have dried flowers in books and things like that. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I have, I don't know, I have a... People say that my house is not junky and it's not clean. It's not dirty, it's just cluttered. And so I have a lot of clutter. And you know, and so yeah, I, you know, that's the kind of stuff I have. I have one or two actual art pieces that you would consider art, but most of my stuff is, you know, the other thing is, is that I find that because of what we call crafts, but people who make stuff. So I have, you know, pottery that I use every day I have, you know, I have other things that people make, like a bottle opener that was made by a blacksmith, you know, things of that nature. Because if you, if someone is making a pot or a bowl or something, and you need one, why go to, you know, to a store and buy it? Well, because it's cheap. Eh, you know, that's right. It's cheap, but it's not inexpensive. You know, and there's a difference between cheap and inexpensive. Buying it from someone who made it is inexpensive, but it may cost more. Mm -hmm. But I think you have a different relationship with it because it's like, I know this person who made it, so I'm going to treat it a little bit different than this machine made that, you know, 2,000 mm -hmm. of them were done. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a story. And you say, well, you know, I needed eight pots. You know, I needed eight bowls. And, you know, he's selling them for like $20 a piece. Well, you know, eight years, you got eight bowls. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can't go out and buy $160 at once. Buy one at a time. You know, I mean, what, you know, we have this idea that we have to have everything at once. 
but nobody says, I want all my life right now so I can die. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they want to spread it out as long as they can. So like, yeah, we'll spread everything out, else out, you know? Yeah. You know, like I buy a bowl a year and like, oh, this is my bowl for this year. You know, well, they don't match. Well, you know, your fingers don't match. You know, so what is this about matching and everything has to be the same and uniform? Nothing is the same because time changes. So even, you know, like you say, oh, you made 100 prints and they're all the same. No, they were all made at a different time, so they're all different. Well, then, you know, you're splitting hairs, Amos. You're getting into, you know, no, I'm not. You were the one who brought up same and different. I didn't even bring it up, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> now that I brought it up, you want to, you know, get all defensive about it. So, yeah, just, you know. So I buy a lot of uh, things by people who make them, mm -hmm. where I can know the maker. And, you know, it's like, yeah, you know. And then you also, do, you know, if you buy one good scarf, then, like, suddenly I don't need another $5 scarf mm -hmm. from, you know, from the big box store because I have one really nice scarf. I have one really nice pair of mittens that my friend made for me and I bought from him. Mm -hmm. You know, and when they go bad, I can take them back and he can fix them for me, you know. Mend them. Yeah. We um, got two minutes. I was about to say, so we're almost done. So like, what, do you have any, do you have any <laughs> parting thoughts that you, wanna, <laughs> that you wanna provoke or gift these uh, uh. folks with? Yeah, uh, yeah, you've used that word gift a couple of times. <laughs> uh, I would encourage people to read a book. I, th I always get his name confused. I don't know if it's Lewis Hyde or Hyde Lewis, the poet, and he did a book called The Gift and gifting, The Gifting Economy because this is what we are based upon. And, and I'm going to leave with this point. So when I started printing, uh, I was also, well, when I was doing calligraphy, I read The Idiot. And so when I started printing, I said, oh, I'm going to name my press uh, the Idiot Press, the private press of Amos Kennedy. Because Idiot is, uh, its Greek origins is a private citizen. And so I thought it was a good pun. But then after reading The Gift, what he says in it is that in Athens, an idiot was a private citizen. It was that individual who took from the government or from the ruling, but gave nothing back. Hmm. And we have become a nation of idiots in many respects. We take as much as we can from the government, but we give little back to the community. And this, uh, you know, at first I thought it was kind of clever, but when, you, when I looked at this idea of an idiot from his, you know, we need to become more of a gifting community where we give willingly of the things that we make and, and we exchange them. Because it is only through cooperation, it is only through generosity that we as human beings can exist. We are too weak to exist on our own. Our children take too long to mature to exist without our care, as, as, not just as parents, but as a community. Because when you look at what we call primitive societies, children are raised by the whole community, not just by the parents. We have to move away from this nuclear family and return to our extended family and extend that family to all humans and embrace us. And that's what I want to leave you with. Thank you. The next speaker will be Sarah Brown. Sarah, do you want to come up? We're going to get you set up. So Sarah makes really beautiful paper sculpture. She does print. She's a letterpress artist traveling from Ohio. We're excited to have her. Um, these are 561 bluegill fish. Maybe she'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, so I'm going to give them a minute to get set up. I was preparing for this this week, kind of thinking about what I wanted to say and um, gearing myself up to speak in front of a crowd. I usually spend my days talking to my cat. So, <laughs> so, you know, public speaking is something I'm a little, was, felt a little rusty on, but I had a dream that I was standing here in this room and there was nobody here and I was so disappointed. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate your presence and I'm happy to be here with you. Um, I'm just gonna tell you my story and then I'll tell you kind of where that's taken me and at the end I have a big announcement. 
I see a finger. You're good? Oh, OK. I thought a finger was pointing at me. All right. <laughs> so every printer I know has an origin story. Uh, it doesn't always correlate with owning the equipment. It's just that moment that they kind of fall in love with ink on paper. My story started when I bought a small tabletop press from a woman I worked with at a farmer's market. Um, she was very convinced that I needed to own this, and I didn't even really know what she was talking about. She was like, <laughs> you know, a letterpress. And she was like moving her arms, and I was like, yeah, I like printing. I like that. <laughs> OK. And she, like, she said, I need to own this. So I bought it from her, um, and I hauled it around with me for a few years. I moved it to different apartments. And before I moved it one more time, I decided I needed to find other things to go with it. I needed to turn it into a useful object. So I started to look for the stuff. Um, I was on my way home to my parents' house in Buchanan, West Virginia. And I stopped in the small town of Philippi. And I went into their newspaper office. And I remember walking in, and the, there were some cuts that they had glued to a board. And, had mounted on the wall, and I thought, like, oh yeah, those I those are things that I think you print in this thing that I have. <laughs> and I walked up to the desk, and I was like, I I have this press, and what do, what do I need? And they invited me back into the press room, and like that was the moment. I opened cases, I touched like the soft, worn metal, I dusted off old boxes, and I stared at these big, ornate machines, and I just fell in. I liked the way it felt in my hands, and I liked the way it all smelled. And I loved those machines. So I've, I've always worked with my hands. Um, my hands like tools, most often mechanical tools. I've spent a lot of time on a sewing machine, like from childhood into adulthood. Uh, I started in college in photography with a 35 millimeter camera and a love of the dark room. And I took some printmaking in college too, but I was a little, um, I was just a little lost in the art world. I didn't really know where I was going. So I left the arts to study horticulture. And I liked that work. It was basic, methodical work with your hands with fine attention to detail. So I pursued it professionally. I worked on several farms, and eventually I ended up growing over an acre of flowers to sell at farmers markets and to, um, to florists. So I spent years working on irrigation lines, shifting and altering tractor implements, working with hand tools. But by the time I found that equipment in Philippi, uh, even if I didn't want to admit it quite yet, my brain needed more creative challenges, and I needed something more tactile to worry about than the weather. <laughs> so the owner of the newspaper said he was going to scrap that equipment to uh, make room for a new digital press. So I bought it. I moved it to a grain warehouse, an old grain warehouse in my hometown, and I started to learn to run it. I used what I had, time, the internet, and this equipment. And slowly, the story in the process of letterpress unfolded. I'd read on Briar Press, and I'd have to stop and define each word. Like, it was just all so new to me. But it was a series of small discoveries. The thin letting and the thick letting correlated, and the furniture corresponded with that. Finally, somewhere, I read about a pica stick. And then I figured out that that was a ruler, pretty much. <laughs> and then it all kind of came together. The press was the same. The press that I ended up with is a Heidelberg windmill, which is a fully automated platen press. It's kind of a big, whirling beast of a machine. So, so I just learned to run it through the function of each, pro of each individual part, and hours and hours and hours on the internet. <laughs> I actually didn't have service in the shop, so I'd like go to the shop and I'd, like study the machine and think about it and take pictures, and then I had to go home to my parents' house and I was like living in this little trailer, and I'd like get on my computer and research it, and then I'd go back down to town and like <laughs> try to figure this out. It was ridiculous. It was like I don't think I even had a smartphone. 
Um, so through this process, the pieces told stories. There's this deep, thick layer of blue ink deep in the windmill. There's this uh, deep impression of the lower guide in one piece of furniture. And of course, there's the nicks and the scratches in the type. Someone else had done this. Someone else had made mistakes, and they had learned lessons with this equipment. So I combined this evidence that I was collecting from this, these machines and tools to tell stories of my predecessors, stories of like encouragement and tenacity, of process and ingenuity told through the equipment. And I kept going until um, each day became less about the struggle and, the, and learning and more about production. Early on um, in my letterpress education, I took a wood engraving class from Jim Horton at the Augusta Heritage Center in Elkins, West Virginia. Wood engraving is a relief image making process that was developed in the mid 1800s to accompany the printed word. Uh, Woodcuts are on the grain of the wood and you use a chisel, but they kind of, they're limited in the size and detail you can attain. Metal engravings, can, you can achieve fine detail, but um, they don't hold up for long runs in the press. So elements of those two processes were combined. In a wood engraving, okay, I'm gonna use this thing. Oh, yep, there it is. <laughs> Okay, so in a wood engraving, this is a wood engraving block, you can see that the grain is on the side. This is the surface of the block. So the grain is turned upright, they say on the end grain, making it much stronger and it can hold super fine detail. The tools are engraving tools. They're not chisel shaped. Here it is. This is my tool. Um, it comes to a fine point. Can you see it? It's not a chisel. It's like it's just this fine, very fine point. And so you can almost, I don't know if this is going to work, but you can almost just, you're almost just pushing the fibers out of the wood. So it's very fine detail, and you're able to make small images. So the chase of the windmill is, I don't know, like 9 by 13 or something. I always forget. But, you know, it's like you can print about a, like a, small piece of paper. Um, so now I had an image making process that I could pr print in my press. I had learned how to handset type and m most of the time was still much fuss. I could print something on this on the windmill. Um, it was definitely a questionable endeavor. So I named my business questionable press. <laughs> and then I had to figure out what to make. Letterpress is an art and an industry of communication. So what story did I want to tell? I had left the arts because I was just disinterested in expressing my story. I didn't feel driven. Um, but luckily, I had ended up with this job press. The windmill excels at running long runs of small things. It was used to print all the small pieces of paper that businesses would need in a small town, like invoices, letterhead, et cetera. So it was designed to print jobs to help others share information. This is a big generalization, but most people in letterpress shops using windmills today uh, are printing lighting announcements and greeting cards. Amos uses it for something completely different. And there's still plenty of print shops using them to die cut, number. So they're used for different things. But I would, so when I was doing my research to figure out what I could make with this, I saw that most letterpress shops were making wedding announcements and greeting cards. Well, wedding announcements make me really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I started kind of thinking about greeting cards. And I realized that they offered a way to help others communicate. And I liked that concept, so I started there. I stuck with wood engraving, even though I had learned by that point uh, how to use polymer plates, because I, I liked the hand-carved lines. It showed my work, it showed the process, and my intention, and it kind of stole the, told the story of how this was created. Uh, when I need text, I still handset type. So I work in a pretty small box, but within that box, I just keep trying to make paper ephemera. 
or as I like to call it, whim whim. <laughs> I just in an attempt to try to figure out what I can print and what that print communicates. So it's an exploration into how to share and provide an experience through a sheet of paper. It's an emotion or a story told through the work. These fish, which you can see on both sides, um, they're sold as kits. They're packaged with adhesive and instruction. So I thought I'd tell you like the process of how I designed them, mostly because I don't know how to fill up 20 minutes talking about myself. <laughs> OK, so when I think about making them, I just start sketching the object that I want to make and thinking about like the planes of the surface area, just that shape, the basic shapes of the object. Um, and then I start cutting paper and taping it together. And, I, and then I look at it, and I kind of scribble on it to, make alter to know where to make alterations. I'll make a line, draw, draw a different shape. And then I take it apart, recut that piece, double it, trace it, double it, trace it, cut it, tape it together, and see how that looks. And it's just the process of like making these pieces of paper, you know, represent this object I'm trying to make. Um, and I cut and tape and cut and tape and cut and tape. Sometimes it's like only three tries. Like I just made a dragonfly and the wings, three tries. But the head took me probably 20. I just wanted it to be like just the right shape and angle. Um, so once I get the shape that I want, I order a die. And a die is like a cookie cutter that um, cuts the paper in the press. So this is the die for the fish. The front side of it, you can't really see it, see the die itself because there's all this foam on it. Um, the foam helps push it back out from the platen. So here's the back of it. It's type high rule, cutting rule, so it's just like, it's a sh almost a blade that's mounted um, in this board. And there's also creasing rule, so it bends where I want it to bend. Like there's, a, there's one, you can see it, and there's one. So that, pa that padding, like you know, when it's in the platen press, and if this is the die and the paper hits it, it kind of goes into it, so that padding just keeps, helps it come back out when it's in the platen. Um, so I order the die first. This is the die for the fish. And, and then I put that in the press, and I run a couple of sheets. I, cu I cut a few sheets, and I assemble it. And then I draw on that, and then disassemble it, and use that, those pieces to um, create the block that I carve. So I, I'm wonder, I wonder if there's a better way to do it, but I'm too nervous to carve the image before I have the die because I want it, I need it to register to the die. And I don't want it to be shifted in the press because locking up and picking up a platen or a chase that's shifted is like no fun. So this is the piece, this is the block. It's a wood engraved block. Um, you can see it's on the end grain. And I had drawn on the page, I set this on here, and then I carved it. I take out all, all of this space right in here is all white space that I think on this one, maybe I used a Dremel. I've moved on to a router by now. Um, and these little dots, as you can see on this, here's a printed sheet. So we will make it backwards. All right, and then I die cut it. Um, after I carve it, print it first, then die cut it, and package it. So I thought I'd assemble one of these to show you. Oh, yep, there we go, a little fishy. And I have other things to say while I assemble it, but I have to look at my notes. <laughs> okay, hold on. So as I'm designing it, I better take these over here. Um, I have to make sure that it's an action that can be repeated, not just by me, but by another person's hand. 
And I also have to consider the pattern. So the white space is the space that you cover. Um, I kind of started this kind of project making masks. And then the masks, I didn't have a dye for them. And people thought they were for children and that children wouldn't take care of them. Um, and they didn't want children, or nobody really wanted to cut it out, which I, I love cutting paper, but you know, like the general consensus was no one wanted to cut paper. So that's why I started ordering a die. And no one owned a hot glue gun, which is fine. This is, <laughs> it's really, um, it's also, it's a reaction to folks at craft shows. I, I sell a lot of craft and art shows, and a lot of people would come up to me and say, um, look at my work and say, I could never do that, or I'm not creative, and I just think that's a bunch of junk. Every person has creative, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 thanks. No, thanks, and if I do it again, just wave your hand and I'll be better. Okay, instructional video. So people would say, um, I, can, I can't do that. I'm not creative. And that, to me, everyone is creative in their own way. I think that as uh, um, many adults have disconnected from their creativity. And so this was just one, it was just an exploration in how to shift um, that perception of your capabilities. So I really designed these for adults. But I wanted to make them easy enough for a child to put together because I had realized so many people, it's maybe half and half. Some people think they're for kids and some people don't. So um, you just stick it together. So as you can see, I'm covering up the white space with the other pieces. I also have to, so I have to think about the pattern. I have to think about the, um, the action, like if it can be repeated by another person. And then I also kind of need to consider like the tension in the paper because like if too much, too much tension. I love those like the or kind of organic lines you can create with bending paper, but um, too much of it, they, the, it starts to kind of come apart. Um, this is kind of in the paper craft realm, but most paper craft is more geometric than this. And uh, I haven't, I'm not necessarily saying I'm the only one that makes stuff like this, but I haven't found anyone else. The world is huge and not everybody's posting things on the internet with the hashtags I look for, I suppose. So I'm, <laughs> I don't, don't necessarily think that I'm the only one making it, but I haven't found anyone else hand carving images for, um, for paper craft. Are we still under the thing? OK, cool. And the last little glue dot. Um, there's other critters, too. I have a turtle, a lizard, a toad, and now I'm working on making insects. So the first one I have finished is a grasshopper. And as I referenced, I grew up in West Virginia, so I really it was pretty rural upbringing, spent a lot of time outside. So I, I wanted to find a way of bringing attention to the other life around us and to remind others of the importance of the natural world. If I, I had to move away from actually working in the natural world and in, um, outside every day. But I still find value in those experiences I had. All right. What else? All right, so there's, there's my story of how I created these, my intention. And then there's the, the story that the lines of the wood engraving tell, and also that, oh, ta-da, ta-da, yay. <laughs> OK, let's, 
there's that story of the creation. There's the story of the lines of the wood engraving. And then that the, the ink on the page and what that says. And then when it leaves me, there's the individual story. It's the experience that they have assembling it and what the finished piece symbolizes to them. I want this to look better. Maybe he needs to be like that. Oh, like that. Here, yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right, so letterpress, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, has its limitations. We're kind of all working in this little box. I want that to be like that. OK, OK, I'm done. Um, we're working in this box of what we can and can't accomplish. Uh, and then my chosen processes in letterpress with my press, handset type, and this hand carved image process um, are, even, are even a smaller box within the letterpress world. So sometimes I can feel a little restricting. To, so I wanted to shift that description and craft a project to celebrate the strengths of what I can do. So I printed, um, I created over 1,500 of these fish, and actually half of them are halved. So I printed like, you know, seven, 800, 750, um, and then cut half of them in half. So half of these are against the wall, like that. Um, and this, that um, fish block has been printed probably about 1,000 times before I crafted this project. I printed it that's 1,500 times, or 800 times to create all those fish, but that's just a little blip in the life of this block. It's like, it will live, if I treat it well, it will continue to print for thousands more. And then the press prints and die cuts each one the same. So this is just this was a, pro, a project for me to kind of express the, the abilities of my equipment. But now that I've hung these fish a few times, I've been able to look at them and learn from the project. I've learned that there's strength in numbers, and that there's value in camaraderie, and in the impact of the community, not just in viewing them, but in the ha in experience of hanging them, communicating with people on how they might go up and how they will look. Um, over the years, I've taken a few classes in letterpress and done a few internships, and I've gained a small insight into the letterpress community, but for the most part, I've just stayed in my garage and worked by myself with my kitty cats. Oh, and the equipment. <laughs> and my fish. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of do, I feel like I might have like made myself some friends. <laughs> like if I can't go outside, I'll make it. I'll make things that I used to find outside. <laughs> uh, as I continue to grow and accept my role as a letterpress printer, I've started asking different questions. And they're questions I can't find the answers to in my shop or on the internet. Why is this important? What is the future of this industry? How do I participate and what can I contribute? I feel like this experience of finding this equipment and having the opportunity to learn to run it um, is really, a, I feel like I've been given a gift and how do I keep giving that, recreating those experiences for others? And, and I seek out like more encouragement. So the lessons I've learned through my predecessor's work and mistakes and ingenuity are not the only stories of our industry. Letterpress printing is alive and well. There are endless stories in the 500 plus years of its history, and there's countless others like mine, and then there's others that are completely different. Individually, these stories are intriguing and comforting. Other people love this old equipment and like, just talking to someone that is, is equally as obsessed with, <laughs> with these old machines is like, it really fills my heart. There's other folks crafting ways to answer the same questions that I have. And there's also people crafting other questions to be answered. They're making work with what they have, with what they've found, the tools that they've chosen, the processes that they've put their box around. And they have stories for how they've come to that place. I have my friends in the industry, but I just seek a broader picture. Because when they're presented together, when these stories are presented together, 
um, they can start to offer a more powerful representation of the community, of its importance, and of where it's going. So I learned to print through the tools and equipment of the print shop. I learned to tell stories and attempt to create experiences through solving, answering, trying to answer questions. And so now I have this new list of questions. I just needed a new project. I need to hear more stories. I needed to collect them and share them to contribute them to the print community. So this is my big announcement. I decided to start a podcast. And I have a little thing. Hold on. I really like this because I didn't have to do any digital work to get to this point to like show you guys stuff. OK. It's proof, a letterpress podcast. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Um, like usual, I went to the internet to learn how to do this, and they talk about a launch party. Well, you're it. You, <laughs> you are my launch party, you're my guinea pigs, and you're the first to know about this project. I have postcards here with me that I'll put on that little table there in the back for you to keep as a reminder and to share. Um, there's, the website is on the back of them. Proof, letterpresspodcast.com. Stamp or die. My partner was like, oh, much, isn't it? And I was like, I think they'll get it. <laughs> um, the website's on the back, so you can find the podcast there. Or in theory, you can find it anywhere you find podcasts. But if you don't, please email me, because that's something I'm working on. Um, I'm working at collecting interviews to hear the stories of the community. But because it's, it's not just about putting individuals on a pedestal. It's, a, it, it's an attempt to, to represent and collect stories of the broader community. So I'm also working at crafting ways to hear from everyone, that want, anyone that wants to contribute. And the first one is to craft a five word sentence that tells why you love and or pursue letterpress printing. Um, you can if you listen to the podcast, it says on the end how you can send it to me. You can record a, you can either come upstairs today and tell me, and I'll write it down. That's the most direct. <laughs> um, or you can send me a voice memo or an email at sarah at proofletterpresspodcast.com. Or if you go to the website, there's a form right in there that you can fill out. So that's it. Thanks for listening to me. And I hope you find the podcast. And please send me feedback. It would really help. So this is Greg Walters. Greg Walter, I hear he has some of the most unique and amazing typecasting equipment in the country, or in the world, actually. Um, he is a typesetter and a printer. And he is here to share lots of information with us. So I'm very excited to, to bring him up. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk about old stuff, um, not stuff that I do. Um, I uh, put together a presentation about the um, Printers International Specimen Exchange. That's a series of 16 books that were put out. Um, and it, it was the period that was basically the high watermark of pure typographic printing. That is all done with type as opposed to engravings or, or photographs and things like that that, that came later. Um, and it encompasses something called artistic printing. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, that was an American invention. Um, the, it kind of starts with Harple's type, typograph, um, which is published in 1870 by Oscar Harple in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and what uh, he was a printer who was doing very fine work. And this was basically a specimen of his work. It was a book that, here's all the great stuff I printed. And I'll sell you a copy of it. But it was also a, a call to printers all around the country to do better work. Here's an example of really good work. You should be doing work like this. Um, and uh, part of the reason they, this was happening was because at the time, chromolithography had come in, which was beautiful color printing. Anything you could draw on a stone, you could print. Um, so now the, this was taking business away from typographic printers. So typographic printers 
wanted to make their printing fancier and more colorful in order to compete. So Harpo's typograph was the first uh, thing to come out in, along this line of showing samples of great printing. Here's a page from Harpo's typograph. Uh, you can see like Chicago Steam Forge works and the, the curves and the swashes. It's, it's trying to imi imitate lithographic printing. Uh, in this case, they would have had to uh, cut it on wood to get that. You, you couldn't actually set that typographically. And again, this border is probably cut on wood, but the rest of it is all typographic. Lots of color. And another one. Okay, at the same time, uh, artistic printing was invented. It was invented in the USA, and um, you, you'll basically see from the samples what it is. Um, it tends to use lots of rules, and they're often at angles. Um, it's lots of colors generally, although some, of, some samples I'll show don't have colors. Uh, but they, they like to put a lot of colors in, and very bright colors, um, as opposed to muted colors. And it often has fields of background color. They'll fill in uh, the whole card with color. Um, and it has what I call violators, um, which is something laying on top of something. something vi you'll have something, and then something else will violate it by laying on top of it or going across it. So they, they use these violators all the time. Uh, which are also basically, um, well, the ribbons I, I'm mentioning at the bottom are, uh, that's a whole other <laughs> uh, thing we'll come to. Um, so this is still an Oscar Harpel's typograph, uh, some, some of his work that's along that line. In the top one, you can see the type at an angle and all the rule work, the fancy corners, which it took hours and hours and hours to create. A, a, a straight line, a piece of metal that prints a straight line. And here they've, you know, gone away from a rectangle. It's, they've completed, completed a completely different shape and they've bent the rules. Another kind of strange one. But, but these were early attempts at artistic printing. Now I'll, I'll switch tracks here and talk about something else you'll see. Uh, chaos type, owl type, and selena type. And uh, this is a, a method of creating an interesting pattern. And basically the difference between the three is how the pattern is achieved. Um, this gets kind of technical. And I should, I should put my watch out here so I can keep an eye on the time. Um, but basically the idea was that you made a a printing plate by pouring metal, and you could pour the metal out onto a table and pour a little bit and then pour some more and then pour some more, and there would be ridges in between each pour, and that would make a pattern. Or you could uh, take a piece of paper and you could slop some paint on it or a plaster of Paris and then pour metal on top of it, and that would make a pattern. And they would use these as printing plates, so the three processes were depended on how you made the plate. But then when they printed it, they would just print a solid of a bright color, usually like red, and then they would do a second printing with gold, brown, gold or silver bronzing powder, which would cover the red, and, but this was with a plate that had the holes in it, and so now you had a pattern. And then the third printing that would be out of register with yet another color, and it creates this three-dimensional effect. So there's an example of it. Uh, you could see it was originally printed in red, then they printed silver with the pattern, and then they offset it and printed a light blue. And it makes a really neat effect. So you'll see these in a lot of pieces from this period. It was very popular for about 10 or 15 years. Uh, here's another couple pieces uh, at the top and bottom. Okay, here's an example from England. Um, they had uh, magazines for artistic printers, uh, Superior Printer, American Art Printer, I think there was one called Model Art Printer also. 
and they had examples of artistic printing. Uh, again, they were trying to spread the word. Printers, you've got to do a better job to compete, and here's things you can do. And so they had articles about it. So here are these borders where they've um, put a pattern in the middle, and they made these patterns by taking a wood block and pressing sandpaper against them or putting a piece of um, book binding cloth into a stereotype and casting metal against it and using that as a printing plate. And then, as you can see on the right-hand corner, they put rules and ornaments beside it to complete it. Another big thing they did was twisting rules. They would, these were all straight rules, and they've taken pliers and bent them. And it gives that kind of wacky effect. And here's an example of a, a finished uh, product. And this, this was very characteristic of artistic printing. And uh, a company made a machine called the Wrinkler, and this is an example of all the kind of things that the Wrinkler could make. What, what kind of rule were they bending? What type of metal? Brass rule. Brass. They used brass rule. And nowadays, that's kind of hard to come by. We have yeah. metal rule nowadays, but they, used, they did everything with brass rule. And there's a, a whole page made with the twister. Okay, here's an example of artistic printing from Cincinnati. And again, this one is black and white, but I've seen this one with color. Everything filled in with color. Here we've got the stuff on an angle and things laying on top of each other. All done with type and rule. And another one that's black and white, but probably was done in color at some point. Now here's a nice piece in color. And a lot of these pieces we're going to have to go through pretty quick because I got a lot of images. <laughs> but they, they are amazing. Here's uh, Hayton Dudley and uh, Poughkeepsie was a, a big uh, artistic printer. Uh, this I snatched out of a, um, a, a German typographic magazine. And I, I like it because this shows the finished piece. But this shows the, all the wood blocks that they had to cut to do the coloring. So all the darker stuff is actual type and rule, but then to add all the extra color, they cut wood blocks up and filled it all in with color. So the Printers International Specimen Exchange, after Harple got things started, printers started talking and said, well, we need to come up with a way for everybody to see everybody else's work. So the idea was, a bunch of fine quality printers would each produce their best work and they would all send it to somebody who would then collate everybody's work and send everybody back. So if 400 printers sent each sent 400 pieces in, they would shuffle them all together and every printer would get back a set of 400 pieces of every other printer's work and his own, of course. And uh, the... The deal was that you could do this, and you had to pay a certain amount of money for the service, and you got the pieces back, but if you paid extra money, you got it bound as a book. This went on for um, 18 years. The last two years, they doubled up because it was kind of starting to fail. Uh, so there's 16 volumes uh, from 1880 through uh, 1898. Uh, it was... In, in England, but it was international, so there were U.S. printers, there were German printers, there were printers from around the world, uh, the Nordic countries, even Japan had a type foundry that submitted some great work. And uh, the, as, you, as we look at these things, you'll, you'll, I, I probably shouldn't say too much, but you'll find out that there's definite style. So the Americans tended to favor the artistic printing style, the Germans favored a very classic style. That piece that I showed from Germany was very, you know, it looked like architecture. It looked like colored architecture. And the Germans tended to go with that style, very classic and rigid. And, and then the English kind of just threw everything in a pot and shook it around and printed it. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't have much design qualities to it. <laughs> So as we go through, you'll pretty much be able to look at something and say it's one of those three styles. So 
artistic printing, stuff at an angle. This is American. This is American. That's a fabulous piece. The ink companies did some of the greatest uh, work in this artistic printing field because they wanted to show as many ink colors on their business cards as they could. Let me see. I want to. Okay, I wanted to mention something else on this particular card. Uh, if you look at that gold border around the edge, you'll see a pattern there. And um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Nowadays, when we print with gold or silver ink, we just take it out of the can, we throw it on the press, and we print with it. But in the 19th century, they didn't have gold and silver ink like that. Um, and what they did was they printed with a clear varnish or with red, uh, if they were doing gold, and um, some other color that would work. And then they put bronze dusting powder on it. And bronze dusting powder is actually not bronze, it's actually aluminum. And it's uh, anodized aluminum that's ground up into a fine powder. So it can be gold, it can be green, it can be red, it can be different colors. But basically they, they dust, printed a, a solid varnish and then dusted it. And it gave you this really intense matte finish that kind of glowed on the paper. And you'll see these samples upstairs. We're going to have books out for you to look at, and you'll see how great this uh, gold looks, gold and silver looks. Well, there was a technique that you could do that you could then wait until the ink had almost set up and then run it through the press again, and it would get a lot shinier because it would flatten down the metal particles. So in this case, they printed it, they dusted it, and then they printed a border on top of it, and the border came out shiny. So that's why you have the two tones. And it's very, very neat to see in, in the actual print. Another American. American. And again, these are all artistic printing from America. And uh, this looks British right away. I didn't have it written down, but I can tell right away that that's British. And you can see everything's just kind of thrown together. They have a bunch of ornaments. You just threw them in, the, and they had wanted to put some color, so they just threw the colors in there, and away we go. This is a little more organized. This looks a little more German, but it's, it's not. It's English. Uh, here's a... <laughs> Uh, uh, one of these chaos type things, but instead of doing it the normal way, they just threw three different plates down there and tried to make it look like marble. <laughs> There's another chaos type. Uh, yet another chaos type and a gorgeous piece on an angle. These things really look great when you put uh, a bronze ink on top of a dark paper. pretty organized English piece. That's pretty good for the English. <laughs> and so these ones here, these last couple, are what's called Leicester Freestyle. Um, the printers Raithby and Lawrence were in Leicester, which is spelled Leicester, <laughs> pronounced Leicester, kind of like Worcester and Worcestershire. Um, and they were doing better quality. They were actually kind of really actually designing stuff. And so it, it doesn't look American. It doesn't have quite the qualities that the American artistic printing does. It's kind of a, a in between the Germans, you know, it's a little more organized, and, and the Americans, which is kind of wild and freestyle. It's halfway in between, and that was called Lester Freestyle. And that's what some of these are. This is a neat one because it's got a birdcage made out of rule. Somebody spent a few hours working on that. And there's a, another piece made out of rule. Now the picture itself is a wood engraving, but the uh, easel is made out of wood, rule. Now the English did start, some of the English did start following the uh, artistic printing tradition, as did a few Germans. So there's an English artistic printing. That one looks a little more German. They're kind of following the German style. 
at the same time, also in England, there was um, what could be described as the ancient style or the old style. They kind of wanted to go back to the 1700s. So this is uh, one of those faces. They used a lot of black letter. So there's several of these. Back to the Lester freestyle. That almost looks like it could have been designed in the 1940s. One with a little bit of artistic printing going on. And that's very much in the artistic printing style. There's a really elegant one from England, more German style. Um, here's a really horrible one. <laughs> I mean, the guy wanted to show every color of ink he had and every ornament he had and, and mixed it all up. Some uh, artistic printing is from England. This is not the best. <laughs> and that's halfway there. Another one that, whew, wow. <laughs> Where was it compiled? Was it compiled and bound for the Americans to do it, or? It in, in England, yeah. Oh, in England. Oh. Uh, it was originally um, the Leadenhall Press, uh, Tour and Fields was the company. Leadenhall Press did the first group of issues, and then uh, Rafe B. Lawrence did the last group of issues. Again, Silver and gold on black, awesome. In fact, that was a Rafe B. Lawrence right there in the Lester freestyle. So these are all English ones I'm going through now. And right away, something's different. It's German. And it now looks like architecture. Here they've, they've kind of picked up on the artistic printing style because they've got those bands crossing over, violating the borders. And they've put those diamond shapes in the corners. So they're, they're kind of picking bits and pieces of it, but they're still keeping their classical look. Again, the, the folded up paper, that's an a, a artistic printing classic trick. And this is a type foundry. Uh, that one at the top I really like uh, because it's, it reminds me of a coffered ceiling. I think they looked at a coffered ceiling and said we can do that in type. And the one at the bottom, there's the one at the top, which look at all the detail on that. It's amazing. But this one, we've got this type case in the middle that's made out of rule. And here's one from Sweden, I think. And it's, it's pretty much all in the classic style. And then down at the bottom, it's for a telephone company, and they put the telephone <laughs> poles and wires made out of rule. Another type foundry again. And here we have some of the chaos type again. An Italian one. Another one from the Nordic countries. And 
So the, the ones we've just looked at were all, all those ones we just looked at were from one volume. And the volume had about 400 pages and that's, I don't know, maybe 70. So that's what's in these. Um, this second group here is from uh, a later volume, the volume 13, the first group was from volume seven, so it was about six years later. And in this one, the British ones are a lot better. They, they, it did work, they, they learned, <laughs> they, they got better at it. But we'll kind of blast through these, we're basically out of time. But um, I have uh, maybe about 10 of the volumes that I brought with me, uh, which will be on a table upstairs, and you're welcome to look through them. I encourage you to look through them because they're a lot better in person than they are on the screen. Um, I do ask that you have clean hands and not have any food and drink. Um, these things, um, I, I've been buying them for a number of years, and they, I bought most of mine at around $600 a volume. Um, somebody published a book a few years ago, The Rise and Fall of the International Printers Ex Specimen Exchange, which they might even have it in the library. I don't know. It's an excellent book. It's got lots of reproductions in it. But as soon as the book came out, the book seal sellers raised their price to $1,500 a volume. So they got really expensive. There's another good book, The Handy Book of Artistic Printing, which uh, basically covers artistic printing only and not, not the German and English stuff. Uh, both those are excellent books that I have and look at. Um, and it's, it's amazing to look at this stuff. And uh, I haven't tried doing any of this, but it would be interesting to sit down and actually try to recreate one of these. Basically, we're out of time, but I'll just hold down the button. And <laughs> That's a really nice one. Another gorgeous one. rainbow roll. Anybody here do rainbow rolls? <laughs> There's one from the Middle East. This, this is interesting. Um, I think it's Kobler in uh, Vienna. Um, this is actually woodcuts. So they actually cut like 10 or 15 woodcuts and printed them in multiple colors in order to make those images. And they did, this was kind of their thing at the time, which was competing with chromolithography, of course. It was a lot easier with chromolithography. Um, the, the page is this size, a folio size, about 9 by 12. So yeah, we, she's saying, you're done. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm sorry. This is fascinating. I know we could talk forever about this, but um, he is actually selling upstairs, and it's noon. The vendor fair has begun. We have vendors that are in the room. I want to make sure they have time to go upstairs and get situated to do some sales. The stanchions are removed, so you're welcome to shop. The vendor fair is open until 5.30. We have hands-on printmaking in the youth area for all ages. It's just in there because we have space starting at noon as well. And then we'll have a bunch more letterpress, screen printing happening in the secret lab starting at 1. So thank you all so much for coming out. Um, day two of our ways because we're so excited. Thank you for coming out and have fun today. This program was recorded on October 12, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.